Hi, Jay. Hi, Bob. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for uh, getting up to do this. You are in Japan, after all, where it is early. I am, but it's not that early. It's about nine in the morning. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. No. There was a time in my life when I considered that early, but those those days, sadly, <laughs> are gone. Um, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Jay Garfield. Uh, you are a professor with several affiliations. I mean, you're certainly a professor uh, at Smith College. Um, I gather you're a professor of philosophy at the University of Melbourne as well. Is that right? That's right. And, yes. you, and you still have an affiliation at the Harvard Divinity School? I do. And you may have more, but that pro people have probably gotten the basic idea. Uh, hmm. If there are any more you want to mention, go ahead. Well, the Central University of Tibetan Studies is my academic home in India. Okay. Well, it's good to have an academic home in India in case you're yes. in the neighborhood. So um, we're going to talk about your book, Engaging Buddhism, Why It Matters to Philosophy, um, and which is, a, among other things, an argument that Western uh, philosophers have not taken Buddhist philosophy seriously enough. I mean, you might even go so far to say, I don't know if you would, that some of them are barely aware that there is such a thing as Buddhist philosophy. I don't know. Yeah, I'd say that most of them are unaware or barely aware that there is such a thing. It's um, the, the penetration of Buddhist philosophy, like the penetration, for that matter, of Chinese philosophy, African philosophy, Native American philosophy, into the professional world of philosophy, <clears throat> is, excuse me, is so far very thin, and um, that's uh, a major uh, reason for concern. And in your view, this is a legacy of a kind of, uh, well, if not colonialism itself, a kind of colonialist attitude or imperialist attitude? I think that's right. I mean, at least a, a strongly Eurocentric attitude mm -hmm. that we can see as the legacy of colonialism. And you see that in, for example, people referring to Western philosophy as just philosophy. Exactly. When you've got an unmarked case like that, um, it really treats that unmarked case as the kind of center or default um, domain in the field, so that if people talk about ancient philosophy in many, de not all departments, I should say, let me, I should say, there is progress, um, and there are departments who are beginning to address this, but in most departments of philosophy, ancient philosophy means ancient Greek philosophy, modern philosophy means modern European philosophy, mm -hmm. metaphysics means European metaphysics, mm -hmm. and that if you wanted to teach something from a Chinese tradition or a Buddhist tradition, you'd call it Chinese philosophy or Buddhist philosophy, or African philosophy, in a way that you don't need to call it French philosophy when you teach Descartes, mm -hmm. or American philosophy when you teach Quine, or British philosophy when you teach Russell. Mm -hmm. So there's a real clear marking of a difference between what's normal and what's deviant, and that's pernicious. And you mentioned Russell, so I guess Bertrand Russell gets some credit for calling his book a history of Western philosophy instead of a history of philosophy, right? He does, he does, that's right. Okay, good. Uh, so before we get into the subject of your book per se, let me just ask you what role Buddhism, if any, has played in your life. I mean, uh, many scholars of Buddhism uh, have been personally influenced <coughs> by Buddhist philosophy. Some of them are meditators or have been meditators. What's, what's your own story? Well, I'm going to start by telling you a slightly different story, which is why I won't tell you all of my own story. Um, at a recent seminar um, at Smith College, um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was present on a visit and offered a seminar to the five college Buddhist studies faculty on the topic of the role of academic Buddhism in the transmission of Buddhism to the West. And he opened the seminar by asking the assembled 20 or so scholars of Buddhist studies two questions. The first was, how many of you have been asked by your students whether you're a Buddhist? And every hand went up. Mm -hmm. The second question he asked was, how many of you answer that question? And about half the hands went up. And he said, my advice to you is never answer that question. Here's mm -hmm. why. If you have not, you, you, are here to, you are here in the academy to teach about Buddhism and to study it scientifically and to present it intellectually. If you have non-Buddhist students who may be religious followers of another faith in your class and you tell them that you're a Buddhist, they're going to think you're just trying to proselytize them and they're not going to listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, if you are Buddhist and you, um, if you're not Buddhist, or if you tell people you're not Buddhist, you may have Buddhist practitioners in the class who say, oh, 
she's not a Buddhist. I don't need to listen to her. And you will weaken what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So he said it's much better for students to be really clear about the fact that whatever your private religious practice is, Buddhist or not, that has nothing to do with the academic context in which you're teaching Buddhism. Um, I'm, a, I'm a professional philosopher, um, and I study Buddhist philosophy, um, and I kind of like my work to be assessed on that basis, um, regardless of whatever my uh, personal life might look like. Of course, I'm guessing when you refuse to answer that question, most people are going to suspect that that means you are a Buddhist, right? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I know lots of people who are totally irreligious, or are devout practitioners of other religions who are active in Buddhist studies. And many of those people are very careful to keep their religious views out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I also know many good Buddhists who are uh, careful to keep their religious views out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I guess I think that's kind of important. When we're in the academy, our job is to educate students. And given the fraught role of religion in especially American public life, I think that religious profession in the classroom um, only makes you a less effective teacher. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's also the question of whether religion is always the word. There are a lot of people in America, I think, who consider themselves Buddhists, who basically are talking about what you might call the naturalistic part of Buddhism or the secular part, whatever. They, they're, they don't, in other words, they don't believe in reincarnation. They don't mm -hmm. believe in any of the deities. They don't, you know, it, it, it's they believe everything they believe is. Uh, well, you get the picture, right? I mean, it, it, is that. It should, should that be called a religion when they're doing that? Well, Buddhism is a big tent religiously and a much bigger tent culturally and philosophically. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you study the phenomenon of, of, say, the Buddhist world, which is a way of thinking about this, you're studying Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist religious practice, uh, Buddhist culture, Buddhist art. Uh, there's so many different... Um, domains of impact of Buddhist thought. Mm -hmm. But even within Buddhist religious practice, and I should say I'm not a scholar of religious studies, so I begin to move away from my core area of expertise when I talk this way, but there are, as you know, a number of different traditions, some of which um, might emphasize a particular teaching or doctrine more than others, some of which might dispense with it entirely. Mm -hmm. So that I think that when we find Buddhist traditions, for instance, to take your own example, who emphasize a strong belief in rebirth as a core of Buddhist thought, we can also find Buddhist traditions um, for whom that particular doctrine is a rather minor affair or even is dispensed with. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, no essence of Buddhism that demands that you adopt this particular view or that view. The religious definition of a Buddhist is somebody who takes refuge in the triple gem, or in the Tibetan case, the quadruple gem. That is, who takes refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But notice that that Dharma doesn't... Dharma being, in that context, the Buddhist teachings, more or less. The Buddhist right? doctrine, yes. Right. And, and Buddha, in that context, um, being interestingly ambiguous or having two meanings, one could be um, in the fact of the attainment of awakening by the historical Buddha, or more deeply, refuge in one's own future awakening. Mm -hmm. um, so notice that none of those involve commitment to particular doctrines. They involve a notion of refuge, taking these things as important. So because of that, Buddhism has proliferated in Asia and now in the West in many, many different forms. Mm -hmm. And I'd be the last one to disparage a particular form as not really Buddhist. Um, I think we have to be really careful about that. Right. So it's not, a, it's not a religion, even when we focus only on religion and leave art, uh, soci social forms, uh, philosophy aside, um, it would be wrong to think that there's an orthodoxy um, that defines it. Okay. Now you mentioned that there are many kinds of Buddhism. Uh, and we should say at the outset that the most basic distinction usually made is between Theravadan and Mahayanan. Your area of concentration has been Tibetan, which is uh, generally located within the Mahayana tradition. Yeah. But you do start your book, early in your book, you, you talk about a kind of a common core of ideas. And, and at that point, 
uh, as I recall, what you mainly focus on is kind of the content of the, the, the Buddha's famous kind of first sermon where he talks about dukkha, which is generally translated as suffering or dis unsatisfactoriness or whatever, how kind of pervasive it is, what its cause is, uh, mm -hmm. namely a kind of confusion. Mm -hmm. It's often described as ignorance. You, 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 you prefer to put it a little differently, but some kind of confusion about the nature of reality. Yep. Uh, and so um, then, uh, then, then ending, or at least mitigating suffering, would involve seeing things more clearly. And of course, that's where Buddhist philosophy comes in, because it, it, it is assertions about the way the world really is. And, and seeing the world the way it really is, is, is supposed to be the path to uh, something other than suffering. Yeah. So, um, and then I guess uh, a couple of big concepts you talk about which are pretty famous are there's not self the the idea that in some sense the self doesn't exist mm -hmm. i would say that tends to get more uh emphasis in the theravada tradition in a way although it's certainly part of the mahayana tradition right uh that's absolutely common to all buddhist traditions right um if you've got a tradition that really defends the reality of a self you have to ask how seriously Buddhist it is. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm not aware of uh, Buddhists asserting <laughs> the, the existence yeah. of the self. Um, and then there's the, this idea of emptiness, mm -hmm. uh, which is related. And in fact, in the Mahayana tradition, it, it, it's sometimes taken to kind of encompass the idea of not self. But, um, but that's the idea that you look out in the world and it's not, it's not what it seems. It, it isn't that this lamp, it isn't that there's nothing where this lamp is, but it's that my perception and conception of the lamp has more in the way of kind of, uh, well, you might say substance or, you know, I mean, in, 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 then, it, then it, it seems to have more of that than it in fact has. Now, and you, you spend time on both of these. And one thing that interests me, and, and this is clear in your book, is that um, I think involved in both of these ideas uh, of emptiness and not self is an idea that is something people really associate with Western philosophy, which is just the idea of taking causality, causal influence really seriously, right? I mean, people would think, often think of Western philosophy, you know, because the West is associated with science, which is all about studying causes, they might think of causality. I, I, I think there's an intuition about Eastern philosophy. It's, 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 it's like very vague and you can't even describe it almost it's so kind of amorphous whereas western philosophy talks about causes and so on but but one thing that i think comes through in your book is that um actually eastern philosophy puts a lot of emphasis on more or less what we think of as causality in the west and if anything but follows it further in a certain sense or or takes it more seriously uh does that make sense yeah i think that's right i mean you you pointed to this common prejudice that um, what people will have when they say, oh, gee, so-called Eastern philosophy or wisdom traditions or something uh, is just all so mystical and incomprehensible that it has nothing to do with what we do. And part of the burden of my book is to show that uh, the enterprise of philosophy is the enterprise of philosophy wherever it's pursued and that the, frankly, racist assumption that people who don't look a lot like us can't think a lot like us and can't think precisely um, is something we have to correct. Um, Buddhist philosophy represents and 2,500 years of very sustained analytical work on the same kinds of questions that animate Western philosophical tradition. And that, by the way, is true of the other Indian philosophical traditions, too. I mean, you could do what I did for Nyaya philosophy, for Vedanta philosophy, for Samkhya philosophy. Um, Brian Van Norden is in the process of doing it now for Chinese philosophy. Um, so, <coughs> this, there's not, I don't want to argue in my book that there's something unique about the Buddhist tradition. I'm offering it as an example of the kind of engagement that the Western ac Academy needs to open with other philosophical traditions. Mm -hmm. And I do this, as I say in the preface to the book, because this, this is the tradition I know and that I can offer. Um, so I'm offering this example. But you are absolutely right. The idea of dependent origination, which is the, the kind of Buddhist analysis of how we want to think about explanatory links like the causal link uh, 
myriological links, um, conceptual links, um, is at the heart of Buddhism. Nagarjuna argues that dependent origination and emptiness are in fact the same thing. Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, when he's been asked if you had to describe Buddhism in one short phrase, what would it be? He always says, dependent origination. Mm -hmm. It's about understanding the relations between conditions and the conditioned. Mm -hmm. And one form of in which dependent origination is sometimes put is like basically kind of under this condition this will arise Mm -hmm. you know uh that's the that's the way of 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 phrasing it and so it yeah it sounds a lot like western causality there's some subtleties you could get into you get in in the book you get into hume and the question of whether you know the fact that something regularly arises in a certain circumstance means the circumstance caused that but I think we don't need to go there right now, if ever. Why don't we take something that may seem counterintuitive, like the idea that a self doesn't exist, and mm-hmm. why don't you apply, in trying to make that intelligible, why don't you apply this idea of, you know, what causal influence or dependent originate, whatever you want to call it, but, but talk a little about how these things are related. Sure. Um, we are almost biologically, maybe even biologically, but at least biologically and culturally wired um, to regard ourselves as substantial independent centers of experience, continuing substances um, who endure at least from birth to death or depending on your views about resurrection or rebirth perhaps even after that or even before that. So that there's a very intuitive grasp that we have. Um, it's maybe an innate tendency, but a lot of Buddhist philosophy thinks that it is, to um, regard myself as a continuing, substantially identical thing. And then I think, okay, um, I'm, say, Jay, I've got a body, I've got a mind, I've got thoughts, but those aren't me any more than my clothes or my dog or my spouse is me. I've got a wife, I've got a dog, I've got clothes, I've got a house, but I don't think of those as me. I've got a body, I've got a mind, I don't think of those as me, I think of them as my body, my mind. Now if you want to be convinced that you, a lot of people say, oh that's crazy, I would never think that I'm different from my body and my mind. But you can convince yourself using a very easy thought experiment that you intuitively think that way even if you know at a deeper level that it's the wrong way to think. Here's how to do it. Imagine somebody who you, whose physical prowess you kind of envy, um, or whose appearance you envy if you're that kind of person. And develop the thought for a minute, wouldn't it be cool for me to have his body or her body just for a little while? Like for me, for instance, give me Usain Bolt's body for about nine and a half seconds. Um, I don't want to be Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt is already Usain Bolt, right? He already exists. What I'm imagining is that I want to be me, Jay, in that body running 100 meters in nine and a half seconds. Um, if you can make sense of that, uh, if that thought experiment, mm-hmm. if you can even make sense of imagining it, mm-hmm. then you already think of yourself as distinct from your body but possessing your body. Because you're imagining your body basically being swapped out from a different body and yet yourself enduring. Exactly. Right. It doesn't do any good for me to say I'd rather there be Usain Bolt instead of me. That's already there. Right. Um, or, now I like the, the harder one, think of somebody whose intellectual capacity you really admire. Um, like say Stephen Hawking, right? Gee, I can imagine. It would be really nice to have Stephen Hawking's mind for say 10-15 minutes. Then I could understand general relativity theory and, you know, gravitational waves and things like that. Again, I'm not imagining being Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is already Stephen Hawking. I'm imagining me, Jay, having his mind to use to understand those things. If I can even develop that fantasy, let alone how incoherent it is, but if I can even develop the fantasy, then I know that deep down I think of myself as something other than my mind something that could persist as me, albeit with a different mind. That self, that sense of an I, which is distinct from my thoughts, my capacities, 
my body and my mind, but which possesses and controls them, is the thought of the self. Mm -hmm. That's instinctive. I gotta say, and, the first thought experiment is a little easier to think clearly about. Like, I can imagine myself, like, dunking, you know, mm -hmm. like LeBron James or something. That's, uh, e but, but if you say, okay, really imagine yourself understanding the theory of relativity, a little more challenging, but I, I take your point that people think like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment you, the moment you even think like that, mm -hmm. you have grasped that idea of the ego or the self as the center of experience. Mm -hmm. Now that has all kinds of consequences. The first thing, of course, is that we know it's totally incoherent, right? Take away your body, your mind, your thoughts, all of that. There's nothing left, um, and you've never introspected and found it. It's not as though you either know about this because you look inside in a still moment and you find that little corner that's different from anything else. It's also not something that makes sense biologically, mm -hmm. that makes sense psychologically, that makes sense metaphysically. So it's a kind of instinctive illusion. I compare it to optical illusions. We're wired for certain optical illusions, like the Mueller liar illusion or other illusions like that. Um, and we're wired for the self illusion. Mm -hmm. And the self-illusion, um, according to a lot of Buddhist philosophers, also underlies a lot of our most maladaptive behavior. That is the sense that we are the center of the universe, that I'm subject, everything else is object. That as we have, for instance, in a lot of Western ethical and economic theory, the idea that there's a rational default to take my self-interest as more important than anybody else's interests, mm -hmm. that, there's a, that I need reasons to be good but no reason to be selfish. And the reason I don't need to be selfish is because I'm already me, I'm already a self. But if I'm not a self, there's no default to selfishness. Mm -hmm. If I'm not a self, there's no default to a rational self-interest as opposed to a rational regard for others' interests. Mm -hmm. So the Buddhist analysis suggests, one, that self-grasping is illusory, B, that it's a very important illusion, and C, that it's an illusion that undergirds a lot of our morally and psychologically maladaptive behavior. So it's a causal consequence of the illusion, not of the self, because there isn't any such thing, but of the illusion that we end up behaving in strikingly maladaptive ways. Mm -hmm. When we pay attention to what there is instead, mm -hmm. what there is is a person. And I think the English word person is actually a wonderful way to translate the Sanskrit uh, pudgala for person um, because when we think the, the etymology for person is persona, a mask. It's a mask you would wear in a theater. Um, and person suggests a role we adopt or a set of roles we mm -hmm. adopt. So when I think of who I am, I'm a father, I'm a spouse, I'm a writer, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, um, you know, I'm a guy who's traveling in Japan right now. Um, I'm, I've got all these different roles. Um, those roles de 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 define who I am, but they define me as a causally connected, dependently originated sequence of physical states, mental states, thoughts, projects, plans, relationships, that's who I am. So no self does not annihilate our existence as the people we are. It doesn't an annihilate Bob and it doesn't annihilate me. What it does do is to distinguish the mode of existence that accurately characterizes our lives. That is a conventionally, collectively constituted set of roles and causally interdependent processes as opposed to a fantasy mode of existence um, as isolated selves that makes a hash out of our self-understanding and out of our moral lives. Okay, can you zero, zero in a little on this idea of how appreciating the pervasiveness of causal influence kind of erodes our traditional conception of the self, like thinking about the way something might influence a person uh, would, would change your view of the self? Sure. Um, so here's um, a kind of concrete case in, say, the moral domain. And this one actually comes from the 8th century Buddhist um, philosopher Shantideva, who uh, taught at Nalanda University and was a very influential Buddhist ethical theorist. He says, you know, suppose that somebody insults you or hits you. Um, 
I don't know, they take your seat on the bus or they, you know, call you an idiot or something like that or they slap you in anger in the midst of a fight or something like that. Um, your immediate response, um, if you're conditioned by the illusion of self, is to think that I, not my body, not my mind, I have been deprecated by her, the person who actually did this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Shanti Davis says, let's think about this in a slightly more nuanced causal way. You're not supposed, you know, she slapped you across the face because you called her an idiot. Or you can imagine how these things um, escalate, right? So are you angry with her fingers for making contact with your cheek? Well, no. Are you angry with the muscles in her shoulder for having moved her arm? No. Are you angry with the neurons that ask those muscles to contract? Well, no. Are you angry with the regions of her brain that um, in, were involved in the motor control? Well, no. Are you angry with the movements of your lips that caused the sounds that hit her ear that caused her to do this? Well, no. And as you begin to dissolve this situation into a delicate causal sequence, you recognize that what's happened that's led to this feeling of anger is a sequence of physical, mental processes involving both things going on in your body, maybe bodies around you, maybe the film that you were going to see, who knows, involving her body, involving the culture that's conditioned you, and the motivation for suddenly feeling that you, this isolated individual, have now been deprecated or harmed by another isolated individual in a way that merits an unpleasant, dysfunctional attitude directed towards somebody who doesn't exist mm -hmm. um, in return for having done something to something you recognize doesn't exist, mm -hmm. begins to look just silly. And you may want to begin trying to resolve a problem rather than escalate the problem by, re by reacting in anger. So there's a case in which careful analysis in terms of dependent origination um, with an understanding of no self can lead to more functional behavior and attitudes in a way that is psychologically and morally relevant. Mm -hmm. Now, the way a Westerner might <clears throat> uh, react to what you just said, uh, or possibly an Easterner, but uh, is to say, well, okay, so I get it. So looking closely at what caused her behavior leads you to call into question the idea that within her is some autonomous source of her behavior, some prime mover of her mm -hmm. behavior. In fact, her body is just kind of mediating influence. There's input and there's output. And, and, and the good news is that once you don't see a her to hold responsible, you are no longer angry, maybe, the bad news, some would say, is that uh, there's not a moral agent there, so we can't punish people for the things that they uh, do wrong. Now, uh, first of all, I've heard different stories uh, about whether the Buddhist view of the self or the lack thereof is deterministic and completely denies free will. I've heard different stories about that. But in any event, how do you, from a Buddhist philosophical standpoint respond to that concern. Yeah, it's a really interesting concern and you're right that it's connected to the not identical with the so-called free will and determinism problem as it arises in the Western philosophical tradition. Um, I've actually written some about this and, and, and thought a lot about this. So let me begin by talking about the um, Western uh, free will and determinism problem and why I think it's an uninteresting problem. Um, in, philosophically, though an interesting problem historically, and why it simply doesn't even emerge in the Buddhist context. Um, you're right that there's a big literature. Are Buddhists proponents of free will? Are they determinists? Are they compatibilists? I think most of that literature is actually pretty confused, and I think we can see why it's confused if we pay attention to the context a little bit more closely. So nowadays, um, we are used to encountering the free will determinism problem as though it's just an obvious intellectual philosophical problem that crops up the moment you think about action. It turns out not to be. 
It's a, pro it's a problem with a very specific history. Um, it arises um, in the work of St. Augustine, um, and it arises when Augustine is worrying about a very particular biblical episode. That is, he's worried about the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and the fall as a result of the temptation by the serpent. And his worry is this. If God is really omnipotent, he can do whatever he wants, omniscient, he knows whatever he, everything there is to know, and omnibenevolent, that is, he only wishes well for us, then when Eve was about to be tempted by the serpent, God had the ability, he, God knew what was going to happen. He knew it was going to be really bad, and he could have stopped it. And that would make God a really nasty piece of work and not worthy of our worship. We'd have to conclude he's either dumb, weak, or mean. So Augustine figured there had to be a way to absolve God from this. So he posited, I mean literally invented out of thin air, a new faculty for human beings to have called voluntas or will and posited that God gave us this faculty and made it an uncaused originator of action that allowed us without any previous causes to cause action freely and so it was because Eve exerted her free will that um, God is not at fault and it was okay to punish us mm -hmm. and so from then on floating through Western culture have been this notion that among our cognitive faculties is the faculty to produce uncaused action called free will. Then we wonder, gee, is that compatible with determinism? Is it not compatible with determinism? And, is it, and we've taken it as the basis for moral and legal responsibility. Why? Well, because it became the basis for Eve's moral and legal responsibility. So let me, can, can, I, can, I, so, can, I, can I ask a question, just interrupt and say, do, but don't you think also it does track human moral intuition pretty closely? In other words, you do see, I assume you see in Asia as well as in the West, people saying, no, you deserve to be punished for what you did to me because you did it on purpose. No. As opposed to if you did it like, accidentally or under you right i mean there is this there is this sense that you know there are some circumstances under which the act really kind of arose from you right well i think you're moving too quickly um you're right that in any almost any culture any culture i know of we distinguish between acts um that merit uh, reward or punishment, acts that we want to give personal, and when you use the word personal here, authorship to, and acts that we don't give personal authorship to. But we do not need to draw that distinction on the grounds of whether those acts are free or determined. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if I go to the notary public and I'm asked, you know, is this your own, your free act and deed? And I actually know what that means, right? It's almost impossible for me to say yes, except by crossing my fingers, because if somebody's asking me, did nothing cause you to say this? Did nothing cause you to sign this document? I want to say lots of things caused me to sign this document. My desire to buy the house, my belief that signing the document would enable me to do that, um, my knowledge of how to move my hands and hold a pen. All of those things caused me to sign that document. Um, if, it, if I hadn't been caused, then what would it be? A random event? That wouldn't be an event that would be mine. Um, would it be an event that you know, had nothing to do with my wishes and beliefs? That wouldn't be an event that was mine. For an event to be mine, for an action to be mine, I want that action to be caused by my desires. I want it to be caused by my beliefs. I want it to be caused by my values. I don't want it to be uncaused. That wouldn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. That's really important. I mean, imagine that you, there was somehow a faculty in you that led to uncaused action. You'd have no control over your own body, your thoughts, your beliefs, or anything like that. This is an idea that Schopenhauer actually, and that Hume, before Schopenhauer, had in the West. The idea that the kind of freedom that people believe that they have, that comes from Augustine, and you said this tracks our intuitions. I think you get that backwards. Mm 
Our intuitions track the story. Or if the story doesn't track our intuitions, the story simply becomes so culturally embedded that that's what generates our intuitions. Um, that kind of freedom is inconsistent with action. It's not what makes action possible. Action requires a kind of authorship of our behavior that requires our behavior to be caused by beliefs and desires with which we identify. Now, how can we make sense of that? We don't make sense of that by positing a self that has an, an ability to produce uncaused action. Instead, we posit that, we, we understand that, by talking about the coherence of our behavior with our beliefs, our desires, and our values. And we talk about punishment, if we're being careful, not in terms of retribution and recognition of responsibility, but in terms of effective intervention to modify um, behavior, other own behavior, the behavior of others. Remember, sometimes behavior is directed at the perpetrator, and sometimes it's, uh, that is punishment, mm -hmm. is directed at the perpetrator, and sometimes it's directed at the, um, the, the onlookers, right? right. Um, but in either way, we want to think of reward or punishment as consistent with a kind of authorship. So, continuing the thought of humans as persons. As persons, we're authors of our behavior. And so, I like to think of the distinction between behavior for which we are responsible and behavior from which we're not as behavior that's caused by the set of beliefs, desires, values with which we identify as persons, as opposed to behavior that's not. So if I leap from the window in total despair um, at the withdrawal of the United States from the Kyoto Accords, then we might say that my unfortunate suicide was caused by my values, my beliefs, and my desires. Whereas if somebody bursts into my apartment here and pushes me off the balcony, we say that actually they, that event was caused by their beliefs, desires, and values. Mm -hmm. And so we assign the relevant uh, say we, we say that skillful intervention might involve attention to my mental health in the one case and his mental health in the other case. Um, but in neither case do we need to talk about uncaused action or freedom in the Augustinian sense. So one thing that's kind of cool, if you look at the entire Buddhist tradition, there is no place where the question of free will and determinism is ever even raised. Mm -hmm. That's not because Buddhist philosophers were too dumb to think about it. It's because they didn't have a Garden of Eden, a snake, a fall, and an omnipotent, omniscient God to worry about. So they didn't have to cook it up. In fact, one of the things that I found fascinating that kind of brought me up short about a decade or so ago, a Tibetan colleague and I were writing a book in English and Tibetan to introduce Western philosophy to Tibetan scholars, because by the way, there's also this kind of prejudice among uh, some Asian communities that, gee, Europeans don't really have philosophy. We've got science, but we really don't know how to think. Mm -hmm. um, so we were trying to show them there was some value in Western philosophy, but we were translating some Schopenhauer, and so we hit this question, oh, the word will, how do we translate that into Tibetan? And we both looked at each other and realized there is no word in Tibetan or in Sanskrit that even begins to translate will, because what will means in philosophical English is a faculty for producing uncaused action. And nobody would have ever dreamed of that um, in, uh, in, in that in that culture. So we had to actually create a new word with a very long footnote to explain the etymology in order to make sense of it. Much as when people translate some Buddhist terms into English, they need to cook up a word and then have a long footnote explaining the, uh, the heritage. So, um, so, so corresponding to this difference in the way you think of the sources of bad behavior in East and West is the way you think about the response to it or the solution. You use the term skillful intervention. That's so, right. So in this sense, you, so you might say, rather than saying you deserve to go to prison, you would mm -hmm. say, look, that's just the best way to solve the problem for the time that's being. That This is the most skillful intervention, all things considered, to minimize future aggregate suffering of humankind. That, that's right. And I think that's a much more sensible way to think about the criminal justice system, or for that matter, to think about parenting. Um, um, and education than one that treats what we do as uh, 
retributions and rewards for free acts by autonomous selves that often leads us to um, policies that are driven far more by dysfunctional affect than by careful reason. Okay. So you talked about you know taking seriously the idea that our behavior is actually the result and uh, 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 the result of a lot of influences impinging on us. Um, and, and you used an example where we think of someone else's behavior that way, someone we might otherwise be angry with if we didn't appreciate that. You can also think of your own behavior that way, and that's an important part of, at least in some traditions, meditative practice. Absolutely. And, 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 and you know, it, it's interesting that, actually in both cases, I mean, an interesting, I don't want to get off on this, but an interesting feature of... Uh, Buddhist philosophy, I think under most interpretations, is this kind of um, convergence between making yourself happier and making yourself a morally better person. Would you That's, you'd agree with that? And I, I would actually add a third um, element to that. Making yourself happier, making yourself a morally better person, and making yourself somebody who is has a more realistic view of who you are right so that is a deeper level of self-knowledge right so it's like seeing the the truth although that word is problematic in some some philosophical traditions including some buddhist ones but seeing the reality clearly that's right converges that's right. with being happier and being better that's just an interesting claim about the nature of reality that's right that's right and it's a claim which you know could turn out to be false but it really is quite central Mm -hmm. to the Buddhist philosophical outlook. And my own personal view is, it's probably dead right. Um, I think that people often do develop exaggerated senses of themselves by seeing, for instance, themselves as responsible for their own success and achievements and not paying attention um, to the degree to which everything that they've accomplished is due in large part to the efforts and collaboration of others. The big debate we had in politics a few years ago, you didn't build that, um, where we have all these tycoons You, you saying, didn't build that bridge. Right? Yeah, saying, well, yes, I did. And the, and the idea is, no, you didn't even build your business because your business required the bridge. Right. It required the workers. It required the customers. It required the banking system. It required everything else, right? And when we begin to see what we've accomplished, as the consequence of thousands and millions of causes and conditions that go far beyond anything we'd regard as ourself. Mm -hmm. It gives us a realistic sense of humility. It also allows us not to be so down on ourselves when we screw up. Um, if you understand the sources of your personal failures or falling short of what you expect for yourself, then that's not a reason to absolve yourself of the need to improve, but it allows a clear-headed sense of what it is that leads you to fall short and how to remedy that that doesn't require a kind of moral self-flagellation, mm -hmm. which I think is both confusing, um, depressing, and ineffective. Okay. So, as for this this idea that, that seeing things clearly uh, kind of naturally harmonizes with becoming better and happier. We saw in the case of, of like uh, looking at, at this person who just did something to you that you don't like, that seeing the beha their behavior more clearly makes you less angry, which makes you suffer less. I mean, you know, less gratuitous, unpleasant ill will. Uh, mm -hmm. It... it, uh, it leads you to do what would be, it makes you more likely to do what would be considered the morally good thing in, in, in Buddhist philosophy, which is, you know, involves intervening skillfully and so on. You can also look at it with respect to yourself, right? Look at look yes. at the causes impinging on your own behavior. The claim here is that uh, if you do this and, 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 and see clearly the way your system is working, that can make you happier, it can make you better. Um, and as we said, uh, medita meditation can abet this process. Now, one question I have before we talk about that a little is, is, is that kind of truer of some kinds of meditation, some meditative traditions than others? I mean, my own experience is mainly in kind of mindfulness or more, I mean, in Vipassana, which is very closely associated <laughs> with mindfulness meditation. And there it's, it, it's very clear that the meditation uh, 
is about looking at, you know, looking at, well, everything clear, your thoughts, your feelings, and, and you slowly get a sense for what's causing your thoughts and your feelings. You get enough uh, kind of perspective on them, enough objective perspective on them to, to start understanding the system more clearly. At the same time, this lets you let go of some of the painful feelings and some of the selfish impulses. Mm -hmm. So there you see you're becoming happier, you're becoming better, and, and, and so on. Whereas in other traditions that I'm personally less familiar with, including Tibetan, there mm -hmm. seems to be more emphasis on like uh, visualization. And, mm -hmm. and, in, and in some cases, I would say uh, there seems to be a, a, an attempt for a more direct path to what you could call enlightenment or awakening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like steering you toward a kind of a sudden apprehension of the dissolution of the bounds of self and, and so on. Whereas with Vipassana, uh, it's more of an incremental and systematic mm -hmm. progress toward uh, taking the self less seriously and so on. Do you, do you get the general question? I do. Okay. I do. So the first thing to say is, um, as you know, but ma many of uh, the viewers may not, there isn't one thing called meditation or right. Buddhist meditation. There are many, many, many different meditative techniques um, in the Buddhist world, some of which are quite general, some of which are specific to particular uh, traditions or periods or schools, and they have different goals. Um, the other thing to say, I mean, I'm a little background, then I'll get more specific to your question. The term meditation, of course, is a, an English term uh, with a Latin root. Um, it's not a, it's not an Asian term, so it's not a term that comes from within the Buddhist system. So, for instance instance, the Tibetan term that's usually translated meditation is gom, and that means familiarization, doing something to make yourself familiar with something. Um, the uh, Sanskrit terms, there's many of them, some are better translated as calming, or attention, or, um, or analysis. Um, so there's many different kinds of meditative processes. In very often, the vipassana process, the one that you've described, and the shamatha process, the process of calming the mind, um, are thought of as techniques um, that are preliminary to other meditative techniques. Um, I think of them as um, very refined knife sharpening. So if I go into the kitchen and my knives are dull, I spend some time sharpening my knives. But I don't go into the kitchen to sharpen knives. I go into the kitchen to cook, and I sharpen the knives in order to cook. Um, when we're engaged in vipassana and shamatha, we are sharpening our, our mental knives. Um, we are becoming more discerning, more able to attend, to hold our attention, um, and to focus on particular issues. Um, and to keep our mind calm and at peace and as a kind of stability that allows us to do other things. Now, those are good things in themselves, as you point out, because they have immediate effects. Immediate effects in giving us greater insight. The word vipassana means insight. Um, insight into ourselves and greater calming. Shamatha means calm mind. Um, but very often they're used as preliminaries to other meditative techniques with other specific goals. So, for instance, there are techniques that are aimed at cultivating conviction and selflessness, that are analytic meditative techniques, that are asking you to do philosophical analysis, to deconstruct things you take to be real, to recognize, to dissolve them into causes and conditions and parts. There are meditative processes that are aimed at cultivating an attitude of universal care to other beings. So, for instance, one famous Tibetan meditative technique is the one that involves visualizing all other sentient beings as like your mother. Um, there are techniques that are aimed at drawing, uh, developing an open awareness so that it increases your sensitivity to things around you. Think of it like air traffic controller meditation, so that you're not so much focused on a single point as you may be in uh, Vipassana meditation but rather focused in a broad way so that many different points can become available. There are meditative techniques, especially in the tantric traditions, especially in Tibet and uh, Japan, that involve visualizing yourself as a kind of deity, right, that are meant to 
visualize yourself to give you a kind of confidence and a sense of yourself and a motivation um, to engage in certain kinds of practices. So there's a lot of different techniques comprised under meditation, just like I have a lot of different knives in my kitchen, um, but they all need to be sharpened. And Vipassana and Shamatha sharpen all of those knives. And then you can begin to think about other um, goals that you might have. Meditation in general, I'm going to say in general, fits as the third part of a kind of three-part uh, cultivation scheme um, in the Buddhist world. So the first part is generally referred to as hearing, what might call it studying. So you're, you might attend lectures or watch uh, webcasts or read books, um, and you're actually learning stuff um, in a discursive way from somebody else. So receiving information from outside. The second um, is generally called analysis or contemplation. When you think about this stuff, decide whether you think it's correct or incorrect. Um, analyze it, decide what you're going to accept, what you're going to reject, what the best arguments are. And then contemplation, or now we'll think about meditation, which is when you take these things that you've learned and that you've decided are correct, and you try to internalize them, them so that they actually are effective um, in your own life. Um, so it's one thing to understand something theoretically. So you might understand, oh, gee, yes, everything is driven by causes and conditions, and there's no substantial self. That's cool. And then somebody calls you a nasty name or tells you your last book was trash, and you immediately get angry, right? Um, and so... You, you realize that that theoretical knowledge wasn't internalized. And meditation, broadly speaking, that's why that Tibetan term Gom is so nice, is about familiarizing or internalizing um, all of that. There's a great story told about a 19th century Tibetan um, adept called Patro Rinpoche, um, who went to visit this long-term cave meditator. Patro Rinpoche was a renowned meditative master. Um, who li kind of lived as a kind of rustic vagabond and was you know, often not recognized as the adept that he was. But he apparently went to visit this very famous cave meditator. And they were having tea, and he said to him, isn't this life a great scam? It's absolutely fabulous. All we do is sit around in caves or wander on roads, and lay people bring us food, and they take care of us. We don't have to work a day in our life. We get to sleep when we want to sleep and eat when we want to eat. We don't have to do anything. We've got no responsibilities. I can't believe what a scam Buddhism is. Um, and the guy just exploded at him. How can you call what we're doing a scam? This is the most important thing we can do. I can't believe you would slander us like that. And Pastor Rinpoche says, gosh, all that meditation on compassion didn't do much for you, did it? Um, so he's pointing out this need to internalize as well as to know. So if you think about meditative practice as having that primary function, then you can see how this whole panoply of techniques is related and related to a philosophical goal, which is related to a kind of personal goal. Mm -hmm. And implied there is how kind of uh, subtly the misconceptions about reality are interwoven in our being. I mean, the fact that it takes a, a, a practice, a discipline, the fact that explicit knowledge of about the confusion and about the nature of reality is not enough. It is, doesn't help. Right. It, it doesn't and we know that. Think about the phenomenon of implicit bias. Any of us who have read that literature, even newspaper literature, seriously about implicit bias, knows that growing up as American people, whether we're white, black, Asian, men or women, that we harbor really serious implicit biases. Even if, intellectually, we are socially progressive, anti-racist, anti-sexist, mm -hmm. anti-homophobic, all of that stuff, we know that if we take the implicit bias test, we're going to fail, mm -hmm. because we all do. Um, what that shows is that cognitive understanding doesn't penetrate to our deepest perceptual and affective modes of reaction without a great deal of effort. Right. Meditation is about the transformative effort to take what we know intellectually and to transform our affective and conative lives. Right. Now, uh, we alluded to uh, the concept of emptiness, so we should at least say something about it before we wrap up. And maybe this is a good segue, what you just said, because bias uh, involves a kind of uh, essentialism. Like yep. you, you think of a group, and it's 
it's not necessarily a conscious, explicit belief you have about the group. It's an it's an apprehension that is very much infused with affect, with with like the way you feel about them. But it amounts to what is known as uh, uh, essentialism. That's and, right. And 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 don't you think that's related to? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, the idea of emptiness, right? Is that we are naturally essentialist toward non-humans too, like lamps and so on. Yes. There, there's a sense of essence of lamp mm -hmm. that, according to Buddhist philosophy, is also false. That's right. So essentialism isn't necessarily a theory, though it can be. The Tibetan philosopher Tsongkhapa says there's two kinds of essentialism. There's essentialism that is generated by doing bad philosophy, um, and you can actually get rid of that really easily just by doing good philosophy. And then there's innate essentialism that is rooted in our perceptual processes. It's just rooted in the way we see and experience the world and is very deep in us. And it's just as confused as philosophical essentialism, um, but it's more destructive. And that's the essentialism that we need to uproot. So in Buddhist philosophy, when we say that phenomena are empty, you have to ask empty of what? A lot of people hear the word emptiness and they think that means we assert that things are non-existent. That's not true. Um, just as my room, for instance, right now is empty of elephants, it's not empty of people. When I go to work, it will, it will be empty of people, but it won't be empty of furniture. Mm -hmm. Emptiness is always emptiness of something. And in the context of Buddhist philosophy, it's emptiness of essence. And once we see the pernicious consequences and the confused nature of perceiving things as having essences, we see that any kind of analysis that shows that things are essenceless can be very useful. But then when we come back to the point that we just made a moment ago about meditative practice, we see that it's one thing to disabuse yourself of essentialism cognitively. It's another thing to escape the instinct for essentialism perceptually and affectively. That's much harder work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, listen, thank you. We're, we're, we're right at about an hour, and we uh, generally stop here. There's a lot more we could talk about, but maybe we'll have another conversation. Um, I, and, I, and I want to say the name of your book is Engaging Buddhism. Pretty recent, Oxford University Press, where you get into all, all of what we've talked about and more. You have another book uh, called Western Idealism and Its Critics. Uh, yeah. Uh, an earlier book um, that gets into well how real reality is <laughs> and then, yeah, as her image book that's the one aimed at Tibetan scholars to teach them about Western philosophy right, and why so, they you, so now you, you you've got balance you've done it both ways you've, you've taught yeah. East about West and West about East um, so uh, I hope we can have another conversation you know, I think I'm going to do something I, I virtually never do, uh, and as long as I'm plugging your book, plug mine. I've got a book coming out called Why Buddhism is True, and uh, I'm going to take a lot of grief for that title, but it has a lot in the way of disclaimers and qualifications that I hope will insulate me from uh, valid attacks by people who actually read the book. But we'll see. Anyway, it's, it comes out in a couple of months, and people should feel free to, to pre-order what? I look forward to it. Yeah, we all do. Uh, some of us more apprehension than others. Um, but uh, if I let go of myself, of course, there would be no, no worries about a yeah. book being published. If I could just let go of this idea of the self. That's right. Have you done... Uh, uh, this isn't quite the same as asking you whether you're Buddhist, <laughs> but do you think you've, you've uh, made progress toward letting go of the idea of self, and has it been therapeutic? Um... I hope so, but I don't know. But I think that to the degree to which anybody is able to um, reduce the illusion of self, you're going to be happier and a more effective person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jay Garfield. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. Take care. Bye.